I want to use this time to let people understand that the hardest thing that we have and we have to deal with is the endurance of what we're going through right now, psychologically. You're right. There are people who are nervous, they're stressed, they're worried. A lot of people going through medical conditions. But this is also a great time for us as coaches, people who love the game, to re-engage and reconnect to why we do this. And I know there's a lot of times with us as coaches or as players that we say we want to, God, if I could just enjoy it more. Well, now you have the time to do that. Um, Should we be golfing? I'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, Carefully, maybe. Um, But, you know, I think we have to, we have to use this time to reconnect to what we're trying to do and, and get back and use this time to reflect on us a little bit. I think we get running so fast, we get worried so fast, we get moving so fast that we forget why we do things. We forget why we connect to our clients. And I think from a golfing standpoint, just think, yeah, there's an echo there. Can you want to turn off the one, Kevin, I think there's an echo coming from one of the streaming services. Yeah. I just, I just, is that better? I think that's better. A little bit. Chase, we're working on it. Oh, no, there it is. There it gone. It may be, it may be that you, you may want to put on some headphones and run the sound through that. All right. Um, but I'll keep talking. Just work with the echo yep. um, right. until he does it. <laughs> and, you know, I think, and maybe the one, it may be that streaming one up there that you're touching. You turn down that volume. That'd be good. So I think, Chase, or, or to each and every person that's on there, I think the important thing that we have to do is we have to really allow ourselves the time to understand what we're going through. If you took a step back and you said, look, we're going to do this, let's say for eight weeks, let's just pick a number. It's eight weeks of time. And the eight weeks that we're going to go through this, there's still 52 weeks in the year. So if we can stay healthy and make the right decisions and use this time to help us in the other 30 weeks that we're going to have in this year, we can actually take this time and and move through it. Um, Oh, one of my old teammates, Patrick Coogan's on. So the, um, you know, I think the, the best thing that we need to do is to manage this and look at why do we love to play the game? Why do we love to coach the game? Why do we love to teach the game? Why do we love to, to be out there and competing? What are the things right now that we can look at in our game and say, you know, if I had the time to fix this, just hitting balls into a net in my basement, I would love to have fixed that, but I couldn't because I was wanting to play. Well, now I have the time to do that. Um, and I think, you know, this time is, is also really a time to kind of buffer against some of the negativity that's out there and the negativity of, you know, the news media, which I'm not saying that they don't have a, a purpose. What I'm saying is we need to buffer ourselves a little bit because if all we hear is negative, all we hear is bad news, we start to carry that. And that's, that's really difficult. We have to take care of the first thing first right now. We have to take care of our mental health and our health our in, and the health of our families. I mean, that, that speaks to anything else. Right. There are things that you should do every day. You should get out and walk. You should have a purpose every day. Your purpose may be planting flowers in your backyard. That's what my wife was the other day. And she was like, man, that felt so good. Saturday we came, I actually went and played golf. I'll come back to the golfing question in a minute, but I went out and played golf and I came back and she was like, you know what? Let's, let's go clean out one of our, our, uh, um, some of our, um, our storage facilities. And I was like, oh, and then I was like, you know, what else do I have to do? And it was nice to get something done that has been over our shoulders for so long that I thought it was really, really cool to to go get something done and feel good about it. You know, owning my own business, it's not the most exciting time I've ever had. You know, I I work on the PGA Tour with a lot of players who aren't making money right now. I work at a university at Alabama who I'm not seeing clients right now. I'm taking care of my personal clients. I'm doing, but I decided to make a switch here. And I said, okay, what can I do? And, and I wrote something yesterday and I put up a YouTube video. I said, I'm going to do the four. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to weed my own garden. I'm going to take this time where I have time. I always complain about not having time. I got time now. So I'm going to weed my own garden. I'm going to go through and look at the stuff that I'm doing or the calls that I'm making. And I look at it and I go, that's just not, that's not good for me. That's not reinvesting in me. That's not giving me what I need in my heart and soul. And so I'm going to eliminate things. One of the things I love to do is create content, write, speak, stuff like, well, we've got so many great technological platforms right now. I'm going to do that. My daughters are 22 and are almost 23, God, almost 23 and 19. And I want to use that time to spend more time with them. My 23 year old's hanging out in her apartment in Tuscaloosa by herself. She's like, no, it's good. See you there. But it's to be able to have dinner with my daughter every night who's in college who I don't know the next time I'm going to be able to do that. Um, 
and, and I'm doing that. I want to read a little bit more. And I think we should all identify a couple things that we want to do. I don't think this is the time to, to say, I want to lose 50 pounds and I want to start exercising seven days a week. I think, you know, the stress of where we are right now makes it difficult to, to stick with some of those very, very difficult decisions. But I think we can each day come up with one purpose we want to accomplish. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with that. And, and I think that's where, you know, it, it's been an adjustment for everybody in that sense. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. I mean, I, I know for me, you know, I was like, well, do I really need to get up at seven o'clock in the morning and go do this, all this stuff? And, and, and I find that, you know, getting in, and I think you and I, you helped me with this, is just get back into your normal routine of what you would do. Yeah. Um, you know, and I make sure, you know, my kids are home from school and doing stuff like that. I'm like, well, daddy, you know, we start at 7.50. Why can't I get up at 7.40 and go, go on my I'm on class? And I'm like, no, nah, do what you normally do. Get up, have breakfast, put on regular clothes. You know, don't sit in, in your pajamas and stuff. Um, but one of the questions that, that I have for you, Brett, and, and it keeps coming up, um, and actually seeing here said, you know, how do you manage expectations we put on ourselves as players uh, to allow for peak performance. And I'm going to preempt, I'm going to start that with, you know, how do you deal with players who've lost their mojo desire or, or, oh, big time. or desire to play? Mm. You know, I work with, and, uh, and you do too, a lot of college players and, and their season's shut down. And even though they can go out and play golf, they're like, why, why would I go play golf? There's nothing I, I can play for. And they don't even know when they're going to start up again. So how, how do you, let's start with kind of dealing with the desire to play. How do you address that with certain people? You know, my answer is actually going to be a little bit different. I'm okay if they take time away from the game right now. Um, this is a, a, an unexpected offseason. And the unexpected offseason that we have is maybe for a lot of them, the first time they ever really get away. You know, our, we do need rest, okay? And we're in a really stressful time in our lives. And it's hard to have motivation and willpower for something um, that we really – don't know what the end goal is. Most athletes have, have, have something on the horizon. And that horizon is what we can motivate ourselves for. Most, most of us have never really gone back to the core purpose of why we compete in the game that we do. Every one of us started because we wanted to solve the puzzle in our own game. We enjoyed the competition. And then all of a sudden it became about a currency for us. It became about what we were going to accomplish or, or what we can do with it. And that's when we kind of lose the joy of the game. So I've told some, most of my tour players, there's a couple of them that are working on some things. They're using it as a beautiful reset. And a couple of the guys that were playing really well, I told them, I said, look, it's okay to take some time off. You're gone so many weeks of the year. Spend some time with your family right now. But what I don't want you to do is feel guilty about it. They just postponed, or there's a rumor they're going to postpone now through, through the month of May now on the PGA Tour. What are my tour players going to really do unless they're working on one thing in their game that they can't get ready for in six weeks. They're going to have a six-week notice or five-week notice. They're going to get to work. The motivation will hit immediately because there'll be a little bit of the fear, which is the greatest motivator we have. So what I've actually told them is, hey, if you want to go play or you want to test new equipment, go do it. If you want to work on something, it's a great time to do it because you don't have to tee it up on, on Thursday. But if you want to take time away and do something different, then do that. I, I saw two of my clients, Pat and Kazai and Brian Harmon, they went turkey hunting yesterday. But Patton was also working with his instructor earlier in the morning. But they're using time to get away. One of my other players just recently, him, Patton did too, their wives had babies. And so it's the first time that, you know, there's like, I'm so thankful that I can be here instead of being all over the world and leaving my wife behind. Um, Billy Horschel, one of my clients, he's been very active on social media promoting the Peloton. And I don't mean promoting it. He's not being obligated to do that. That was his choice of where to invest his time and his energy. So I think, See, and I think a lot of us are saying, well, how will I be peak if I don't do it now? What I'd rather you do is win today and be present today. And I think you'll be fine in the future when we know it's time to go. Now, what about people like me? You know, I'm playing golf and I feel almost, I feel kind of, I feel kind of embarrassed to say that, but our club made the decision based with a medical advisory panel and a legal panel that they were going to allow golf and people could play and they made provisions, no food, no drinks, you know, you can, um, and everybody rides in their own cart. Nobody can touch the flag stick or the rakes, but you had to stay six feet apart. I play with my physician. So I feel kind of okay with that. Right. Um, and it has been the, I'm gonna be honest with you. It has been the greatest stress reliever for me 
because sure. it gets me out to go enjoy going and and I look so forward to it to play on Saturday and Sunday mornings. I usually only play once a week, and now I'm playing twice a week. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a part of me that sits there and thinks, "Is like, am I taking an unnecessary risk here?" But at the same time, I'm not. A, I think I may go stir crazy if I didn't. And we can do it with other ways. I know people are playing tennis. That's six feet apart. You touch right. the ball, but you can kind of do it without touching the ball. Um, there are things we can do. We don't have to be housebound. There's nothing against getting on a bike and going for a ride. Yeah, you know, there's absolutely. nothing, there's nothing that says you can't go fishing, or you go know, for a walk. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, we're, and we're just, you know, we were fortunate here up in the Northeast that at our season, you know, we were out playing golf in the beginning of March, which yeah. is really, really early, That's for early for us. but going back to your coming out of the, you know, take a break, you know, we're just coming, we're coming off of a four or five month break you know, and yeah. we're, we're ready to go. So w- what do you tell people that like, it was kind of, we were given this gift of great weather in March and then it's been taken away from us and we're f- pushed back into another, you know, off season. You know, how do you, how do you, how do you deal with that with people? Well, th- that's not uncommon for people, for players that were on the LPGA tour, the um, futures tour who got one event in, they got to play one week. Um, and the web, you know, one of my web players was like, man, I was playing so good. I was so excited. And now all of a sudden I just took four months off and had to make my finances stretch. And now I'm having to do it again. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's tough. I, I gotta be honest with you. When I lived up in Rhode Island and I was doing my internship or Philadelphia for a couple of years, this time of year was so risky because I would see the beautiful weather of Augusta national on television and I'd look outside and it would be sleeting and snowing and it would break me mentally. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I think I probably don't live in the Northeast anymore because I have, I'm probably a seasonal affective disorder person. I mean, seriously, um, if I'm not around sunshine and warm weather, I have a real hard time. Um, and so I think you have to look at it as, you know, you, we are victims in this. And I think that's what, you know, we always tell people don't play the victim, but we are a victim and we're a victim of an unforeseen circumstance that, you know, has come on. Mm-hmm. I keep pulling on the book, Man's Search for Meaning. And if you've heard me do the webinars on this or whatever, the reason is, is that Viktor Frankl was in Auschwitz. He was a 30 year old, 33 year old uh, Polish, I believe Polish or Austrian, I think Polish uh, psychiatrist and neurologist that was interned in, um, and, and held prisoner of Auschwitz in the heinous conditions of the concentration camps. And he, he noticed that people who, who were perishing there, who were physically okay, they weren't great. Okay. I mean, starvation, beatings, medical experiments. I mean, there was no, nothing good about it. But what they realized was, um, what, what he realized is that people who were still able to find purpose and a purpose every day, even in the concentration camp, were able to sustain as long as their body could sustain. But people who lost their purpose mentally, they, they, they died faster. They gave up. And you can't blame them. I mean, I can't even imagine. I've read that book and I've read the book, The Choice by Edith Eager, who, another brilliant book about being in that situation. I read a book called Ghost Soldiers, and they were, they were reviewing um, people who were in the uh, Bataan Death March and the soldiers that went in and, and liberated them. And it was, a, it was a death-defying order for the Marines that went in to liberate them. But when they got there, they realized that the soldiers that were in the Bataan Death March, who, were now, who survived that, who were in the prison, created order in the prison. They created streets. They created Friday night, Broadway. They created all kinds of things to pass the time. It's the same thing we know about our, our soldiers that were in the Hanoi Hilton. Um, they were, you know, communicating by knocking on the, the walls to each other. That wasn't Morse code. code. They created their own code. And I think what, what we have to do is to Victor Frankel's points, we have to find, we have to find a purpose in our suffering because we are suffering as a victim right now. We, ha- we are exposed and we are removed and we are seeing loved ones die or at risk. I've got a mom who's 72 and a stepfather who's got some health conditions and I, I fear that they're going to have it. my in-laws. I'm concerned about my mother-in-law who's in Louisiana, which is a little bit of an epicenter like you guys are having in New York, New York. But, you know, there is something there. We are finding the time to reconnect with one another. And I think we have to find the silver lining in our suffering that gets us up every day. Yeah. And, you know, as, if you're a golf coach, use this as a time to reconnect to your players and reach out to them on a personal level. If you're a player, um, maybe a good time to, to review what you're doing. I've got a worksheet that if they send me a message through you, I'll get it to them. Um, 
about how to really review your game right now and and ask the hard questions. You know, it's not it's not easy to ask some of the questions when you're on the run during a college season because you're just trying to make it from week to week and event to event. Now's the time to take a step back. So if you can find the purpose and the suffering that you're experiencing, it can give you a little bit more of hope. Yeah, I agree. So now let's let's when we get back to playing and this will give us some time to work on some stuff. You know, one of the questions, and this is a great question from CN, is is um, how do you manage you know your high expectations that we put on ourselves when we're playing to allow for peak performance? Okay, so you know, high expectations, they're a massive risk. And they're a risk because expectations are usually built on fear and doubt. And and the best times that you've played, you didn't expect to play well. You went out there and played your best and saw where it took you. So, you know, what, what Cian's probably saying is, well, no, I expect to play well every week. No, 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 you have high goals and high demands. If you expected to play well, like I expect to play well, man, oh, man, that's a risk, okay? Because what happens is the minute it doesn't go according to your plan, the quicker you are to abandon and get frustrated. What I want players to look at is peak performance arrives by pushing forward and staying in the fight. Okay. If you stay patient long enough, you will create peak performance. Peak performance doesn't come out in the first or second hole. You may start off with six birdies in a row, but it's still hard on number seven. Instead, see, take a look at it and say, I don't expect to do anything today, but I'm going to go and I'm going to have certain behaviors and mindsets that I know I'm going to succeed with. Number one is I'm going to face this round with uncertainty and unknowing, but I know that I am a factor that can make it happen. So I'm going to go out there and give it my best. Mm-hmm. Number two is if it gets hard, I have a game plan. Don't be shocked or surprised if it gets hard. And I like to look at the golf course like it's a, um, like it's an obstacle course. Okay. You're going out on that obstacle course. You don't know where the trap door is. You don't know where the, the, the slide is. It's going to make you go back to the start. You know, you're not holding on to anything. You're in a battle. And so if you can turn that to, I want your average to be better versus your best then the best will get taken care of. So can you handle the ups and the downs? Can you handle the difficulty on the golf course? Can you handle the frustration? Can you handle those things and still push forward and stay in the fight? Then that's how you can manage your expectations and allow for peak performance. Peak performance always starts with patience of allowing it to blossom. There's nothing you can, that's why I don't teach to the zone per se, because the zone to me is a, is almost like a religious experiment that if you're trying to get in the zone, you're already out of it. So go play with what you have, be willing to accept the outcomes and fight like hell to make them better. You do that, that you get into peak performance. Is that why you see, you know, you're having a round go and you're playing well, or, or, or sorry, you're not playing well, then all of a sudden you kind of just give, you know, you, you kind of just relax and give up. And then your last four holes, you, you go, you know, par, par, birdie, birdie or yeah. something. Is that the Yeah, same? your expectation. So the, the traditional expectation trap that I see is a player's done a lot of work. They're playing in an event where it means something to them. They've done the work with somebody like you or me, and now they think, oh, I got it figured out. Oh, I got it. I got it. Here it goes. I'm going to play great. Okay? And what happens is they get out there, and it does, it, it's hard. And they usually go par, bogey, whatever. And then all of a sudden, it's like the game just slaps them. Their mind gets going fast because it's not going according to plan. It's not going. It's like driving through the city and getting lost and having 15 people yelling at you which way to go. That's not the time you turn on your radio louder. and you, 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 you Instead, it's like, Wait, I'm lost. So what happens is players normally, when, when that happens is they say, oh, screw it. Uh, I don't care anymore. I'm seven over par and I'm already out of the tournament. And they play great and it starts their expectation cycle all over again. Right. I'd rather you look at it and say, kind of like I did as a pitcher when I would go into games. I don't know how it's going to go. <laughs> I never thought I was going to throw a no-hitter sitting in the dugout before I pitched. But that's what golfers do. Golfers romanticize and think, oh, it's going to be amazing when I get out there today. No, it's going to be hard. It's going to be brutal. Yeah. It's going to be a challenge. Prepare for the challenge, not the beauty of it. Yeah, I think, I think preparation for that is also important. I know a lot of coaches and actually in, in different sports, uh, you know, my niece was a high-level gymnast, and, and she practiced and practiced you know, to the point of almost breakdown. And, yep. and, the, you know, and the coaches were like, well, if we make practice hard, you know, the actual event will seem very easy. Do, do, you, do you like that? I think most sports, most sports put their angst in practice. 
and train harder. But the difference between gymnastics and golf or baseball and golf is that somebody else is in charge of the practice. So it's like, you're not going to have a great workout if you're not in, if, if some, if you're in charge of your own workout, you're just not going to push hard enough. Just, yeah. I've seen it too often. It's a rare phenomenon, unless you're David Goggins. Okay. That you're going to do your own thing. So the, the reality is, is that in gymnastics, we can push you harder, push you harder, push you harder, but then we got to prepare for you to compete when the lights are on and the, and the judges are out. Okay. In yeah. football, I can make it harder and harder, but I've got to get you to believe that the hard training gave you a distinct advantage over the field. Okay. In golf, what happens is players do the work and they actually practice more the closer they get to the competition. That's what shocks me about golfers. Golfers do more work versus setting back. I'd rather them, you know, pull back a little bit and get away. Like my players that are not in the, in the pro-am on Wednesday, I like them to go to another course and just go play with their caddy. Get away from it. You know, they don't need to stand out there all day and just be on site when they're not going to play. So I think you can make practice harder. Right. But I think you can also kind of examine it from a different perspective and say, look, the work that I did yesterday, the, week, the work I did a week ago, it hadn't gone anywhere. It's still with me. I still bring the tools to the table. I'm still adaptable. And I think it goes to what, you know, Clifford's question was here is mentally, what's the biggest fault that you see with good players and hitting a bad shot? And how do you go about changing it? Is ex that's where we get in trouble. When we make a mistake, we think we got to change it. So if I hit a thousand shots on the range, I hit one bat on the course. Why do I need to go back into my mechanics and start changing it? You don't see basketball players miss a shot and stand on the sidelines and working on their shot. In a game, they roll with it. If you, if you step off of a, of a step and you kind of roll your ankle, you don't change the way you're, you're walking. So I think great players can know what they need to do to execute golf shots, and they don't go about fixing it. They just go back to what their keys are, and they can manage the story. It's like I always use the analogy as a pilot. I want a pilot that can fly through rough weather with turbulence better than they can fly in perfect weather because they're not panicking and white knuckling it. And, and I think great players can take the good and the bad and keep moving forward. It's a concept that I call mental flexibility, which is the ability to take the, the material in front of you and continue to push forward. Yeah. yeah. Tom asked a good question. You know, golf is played in variable environment, weather greens, whatever, why are golfers not prepared for this? You know, and, and that's, that's the age old question is, you know, most people practice golf on, on the, on the lesson tee. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, they don't practice in, you know, golf is the, one of the sports, you know, we, everyone's heard this is, you know, we practice not in the, in the field of play. Yeah. Um, so Tom, and there's the, no the, way we can, and there's no way we can simulate the pressure of tournament golf. Yeah. yeah. There's, 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 it's, you know, there's certain things that we could do with, you know, having people around and doing whatever, but it's really hard to simulate tournament play, tournament play. But you know, Tom, if you could, you know, take your, take yourself onto the course and practice that, that would help a little bit. So put yourself into some situations and, you know, where the lies aren't flat and stuff like that. Um, if you don't have the luxury of going onto the golf course, work yourself around the, the driving range, you know, that you can find some rough, hit some balls, add but, some divots. But let's start with a mindset shift first. Why don't we look at the round of golf as not the same as the practice tee? And look at the round of golf as having greater hazards, greater challenges, but we're going to apply the tools that we have to the different challenges, right? How about yeah. we look at it like that versus I'm going to, like, what's the number one question I get is how do I take my practice swing to the competition? Right. If somebody has an answer for that, don't run, yeah. run. Okay. Because you can't, you just can't do that. Okay. What people have to do is realize that they are two different things, but you don't have a practice swing in a, in, a, in a competition swing. You have a swing for where you practice and you have a swing for where you compete and they are ever-changing conditions. Like, you know, if, if, I, if I'm talking to Bubba and I say, you know, hey, are you going to hit a lot of balls on the range? He's going to say, yeah, I like, but I'd rather go out on the course and hit shots. I love to hit shots, okay? He's not going to try to hit the same shot over and over again because that's just what he enjoys about the game. It's what made him brilliant in the game he's going to accept the fact that his body and his mind are going to make a save. They're going to save a swing every single swing he hits. Okay. He right. actually sees that as a success, but golfers see that as a negative, which blows my mind. Like if you, I, I was playing this weekend and I hit a drive and I hit probably one of the best drives of my day and I played really well. I think I shot right around even. And, um, and I hit a shot and I mean, I absolutely got it on this, the button on the driver ball went, I mean, it was crushed, right? But in the middle of my backswing and my transition, I felt like I looped it. 
You know what I'm talking about? I felt like oh, yeah. I made a weird extra yeah, move. So, yeah. There was something yeah. off on it. And when I looked up, I was shocked at where the ball was going because it shouldn't have gone where I, I should have snap hooked it. Felt like it. But I, that wasn't a sign of a problem. My, 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 my brain did the job to reroute the club because I was probably not thinking about too much of the swing. I was thinking about getting the ball and starting it, and I hit my target perfectly. Yeah. You yeah know? I, think it's, I think it's dangerous when players you – know, I, yeah, I, I see it a lot in lessons. They hit a bad shot, and they react to that shot. You know, you know, I always tell people, look, if you hit three or four bad shots in a row, then, then it's time to address it. But you're going to make bad swings. You're going to feel things differently. You know, I think don't, don't start reacting to, you know, you hit one shot and it's way out to the right all of a sudden. Yeah. You know, well, if you're working you on technique, if you're working on technique, you really can't judge it based on external outcomes because it's an internal process. And so, you know, the, what I, one of the things that I try to tell players and I tell my instructors to do that I work with is don't intervene after every bad swing. A lot of coaches, even on tour, you'll see it on Wednesday, they'll get more active. And I will too. I mean, we all do because we feel the tension of the, Tuesday tantrums and the Wednesday worries of players. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. normal. Okay. But we want to hurry up and intervene because we want to fix it. Right. We want to get them out of that stress. And it's, you know, it's, it's amazing. Sometimes if you, if a player hits a bad shot or two and they look at you and the coach goes, all right, hit another one. And they don't react. It gets right back in rhythm. Yeah. But if the coach yeah. is like, do this, do that. Now we've, we've taken the mind and blended it. Yeah. And I think the thing to do is to sit there as an instructor, and I tell this to coaches in other sports, like, look, if you're going to give them a mechanical movement, if, so, if my coach was going to tell me to work on something as a pitch in the bullpen, if he talked to me after every pitch, I would have probably turned around and said, dude, slow down. Like, I need three or four to get a feeling. I need three or four more to get the, 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 the release yeah. point. Absolutely. Now I'm understanding it. And golf, you know, golfers, we, we hit one bad shot – Go sit on the range one day and watch your colleagues hit balls. You're going to look at it and go, God, I hope I don't act like that. But you do. Yeah. You know, yeah, you really do. do. I think it's, yeah, I think, I think whoever's out there listening, I think that's a huge important piece of information, especially when taking a lesson because they'll, you know, they're coming to me because they're not hitting a certain shot and then they'll, we'll make a correction and they'll hit it straighter, but they'll go, Oh, but it's thin or now I'm hitting it left or, you know, it's not going as far. And, and I think that's a huge, you know, and I'll look at it and I'm like, yeah, so what? You're not hitting it to the right anymore. Let's just go with it. You know, mm -hmm. you, we made a change and now your nervous system needs to adapt to what we just did and you need to process it. You know, and I think that, that goes to, you know, to, to coaching is you can only give people one or two things. Yeah. Well, if I go to Chick-fil-A and I order an eight count and they give me nine, I don't go, God, their systems suck. Right. Go, oh, all right. That was pretty good. But right. our ego is so invested in us doing it right that we end up adding so much value to it and we start adding pressure to ourselves to perform at a level that's just not realistic. And, you know, listen, there's a great statistic that's on the PGA Tour and it's, a, it's essentially that a PGA Tour player wins 80% of their money in five events a year. So in a 25 to 30 event season, they're going to win 80% of their income in those five events. Now it's the 80-20 rule. Yeah. But they are not very good 80% of the time. The, the, what I've worked with on my players is, and it's a question that, that CN asked again about staying present and focused, is I try to get them to, to find their best every day. Don't find the best they are every day. Like find the best that you have available to you today. And that's how you stay present. So if I show up on an event and, you know, and, and I've had a player text me, he's like, <laughs> talk, dude, I just stole a top 10. Like right. this is comical. I didn't have my stuff, but I just stayed in the fight because if we were a boxing match and we come out of the gate and all of a sudden the first two rounds, we're getting our butt kicked. We don't say, it's not my day. I'm out. I'm out. I suck. You would go, I got to adjust. He's doing something I didn't expect to be done. And that's kind of how our body works. I mean, I sit here and I think, Oh, it's great weather. I'm gonna go out and shoot a low score tomorrow. And I get frustrated. If I go out there, I'm like, look, it is what it is. We won our member guest a couple of years ago, my father-in-law and, and me. And um, we have like 140 teams. It's a big member guest and it's a lot of fun. And, and I can't, I'd come in, I would have been playing so bad. My handicap had swollen and which thankfully I started playing good about two weeks prior and my handicap didn't have time to readjust. So I was benefited in that, but um, I'm not a sandbagger. It was really bad, but um, 
I kept telling him, he, he would get so fired. I said, we're not going to win. Just let's enjoy four days of golf with each other. Let's, and, and we did a shootout one day, which is an extra money game, what we do. And I had gone in, cause you know, I'm not the thinnest guy. I'd gone in and they had this unbelievable buffet of, of Alabama barbecue. So I pound that, have a beer and I go out and plug And I literally for three holes during the alternate shot was trying not to have a gastrointestinal uh, uh, explosion or vomit on the course. And we shot an alternate shot in seven holes, three under par with no strokes. Because wow. I would literally hit a shot and go sit back in the cart and say, we're not going to win. I don't know if I can finish. <laughs> and we won the member guest. And it was so funny because I kept telling them, we're not going to win. Just enjoy yourself. And I think to see the question is, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like, look, the best players used to stay present in the round is that they stay present in the round. They eat. Yeah. They eat a lot. We have to fuel our brain. Our brain needs energy. You can't go five hours without eating. You can't do it. You can't do math tests if you're not, you're not eating. Even amateur players that are playing on the weekend, you got to eat every four to five holes max. Um, you've got to feed the engine. So. Yeah. And w what are your thoughts on some t type of hypnosis to, to bring people back or to calm them down? You know, hypnosis is, it's just the power of separating our conscious. Okay. So, if you use meditation, if you use mindfulness, if you just learn to be aware of what you're thinking without judgment, you can do that. Um, I think, you know, I, I used a guy when I was in college who was a hypnotherapist to help me pitch better. What he did is he, he worked me through uh, visualization scripts and I saw myself pitching really well and I really believed it. I believed in what I was doing. So if you sit at night and you see yourself hitting good shots or you see yourself hitting shots from bad areas, I'm okay with. Now, what I mean by that is, it's okay to see yourself hit a shot from the woods and say, Hey, I know how to hit that shot because when it happens, cause it will, it's not like, Oh my God, I didn't see this. It's I prepared for this. Like, yeah. you know, I, I, I know what would happen if I hit a bad shot. And I, and so whatever you can do to reconnect your mind to your intention, the better you are. Yeah, I agree with that. So here's a question from uh, Instagram is from Will's Matt it says, Brett, how much success have you had with creating accountability or transparency to training sessions, i.e. Tracking, tracking performance in specific tasks, to create higher levels of intensity in training? I haven't. Yeah, I Seriously. think that's tough. It's very tough because who's – see, I, I, had a, I had a thought a couple of years ago. Imagine if professional golf was run like the NASCARs circuit. Mm -hmm where owners of teams, and I think Premier Golf League was kind of moving in that direction a little bit, which I thought was interesting. That was probably the only thing I thought interesting at the Premier Golf League. And I'd love to see the PGA Tour create some sub teams and, and compete like that. But what I, what I think, what I was saying is, it'd be really cool if, if we developed six players. And I, I guess, you know, you know Matt and, and those other guys that are coming from team environments, you can do this. But it's like, look, we're going to develop and you're going to work um, – like we train. I've always said the golf channel would have been smart instead of doing the big break, do it with instructors and have instructors build a team and have eight players per team and see who's the best instructors for the players that are there. Um, can they get the best out of their players? Because it, nobody wants to, I, I've never seen a football player who goes out and minus maybe Jerry, okay. The outliers, the, the, the few, the 10 percenters, 90% of people will never push themselves as hard unless there's somebody out there that's pushing them. Just won't. Right. Yeah. It no, just won't. Yeah. So here's another great question from a WX Chorus 30. He says, what's the biggest thing golfers can learn from other professional athletes? Great you question. First of all, coaches need to learn from other coaches better. Thankfully, I have a platform for that called the Catalyst yeah. School, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Yeah. But that wasn't a, a, a pointed question. But I think what we can learn is, um, look, a baseball pitcher goes out and pitches – and the second inning, they get roughed up, give up three runs. It's not an end of a day. It's not a bad round. It's not a, it's not a failure, okay? There's a lot of ways to define winning and success in other sports that many times in golf, we see the final score in the top 10 as the only way that we define it. Um, I think other sports are really good about getting in the, the misery and pushing through it, whereas golfers see the struggle and the misery as a sign that they're not good enough. And so – that's the first thing I would look at. And I think the second thing I would look at is other sports are really good at separating the 
the the personal from the performance. Um, they actually allow themselves to sometimes take on a different persona going into the game that golfers for some reason have been taught for years to not be emotional, to, to have no thoughts in your mind, to hit 10,000 balls a day and have a perfect Ben Hogan swing. It's all garbage. Every se- the, the statement that came out in golf many years ago, like the mind doesn't know what the word don't means. So you say, don't hit it in the water. All the mind hears is hit it in the water. That was a made up statement in a hypnotherapy brochure. There's no scientific fact to it. So why we've romanticized golf as a spiritual experience, because it is when you play great. But I'll tell you, when I was pitching and I had unbelievable command on the mound, it felt like that too, okay? Yeah. But that was, our best performances are not our standard performances. Make our averages better. And I think if we do that, that's why in other sports we have earned run average, batting average, yards right. per game average. Yeah. You know, Tom Brady can throw for 175 yards and his team wins 42 to 10 and we're seeing him as a superstar golfer would look at that and go god i only threw for 172 yards god i suck you know (laughs) like a golfer you know i get the call all the time from you know like how did you play oh i played all right yeah no i didn't i mean i didn't hit it good i was sitting on the toe i didn't feel like i said would you shoot well i shot two under oh my god that's (laughs) fantastic right that that, that's like something to be celebrated yep but you know they want to get on the phone to their coach and go dude what what, what's going on i can't can golfers are so afraid of what the future shot is that they ignore the current shot yeah, and yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Um, here's a here's a question that's come up a couple of times, uh, and it's about the yips. Yeah. Um, and you know, and I and I'm going to start with the, an answer. And and I think sometimes the yips are caused because of something in mechanics, whether it's something in your setup that's not right or the way you're moving, and then it, it's developed into a point where all of a sudden you get twitchy and you can't play. And I've I've worked players, you know, especially in the short game, out of the yips just because they're in, in positions that they can't recover from. Uh, Jim McLean had a great term years ago called death moves or death positions. Yep. And, and getting into those positions will definitely cause the yips. Uh, but then there are some times where, where it, is, it is a mental thing or, or it starts physical and then it develops into a mental. And even though I've, I've fixed their technique – that it's gotten into the head so much that, that it's, it's hard to get out of. What, what are some things that, that you so, can do or, or you've done to get people out of the yips? So true yips are an ultimate combination of a physical problem manifested by a psychological fear of embarrassment. Okay. So I use the example of panic attacks. If you've ever had one, it's terrible. I've had a couple. And it's a sudden surge and a misunderstanding of your body to send adrenaline at the wrong time. And what happens is, particularly as men, we think we're having a heart attack. We go to the emergency room and they go, no, it's just stress and anxiety. It's so painful. You really are worried that it is your heart. And the next time you have chest tightening, it starts again. And the embarrassment part is, you know, either people are afraid they're going to vomit in public or they're going to make a fool of themselves. And the whole, the whole part of it is that we're trying to pull back and get away from it. Okay, we're trying to escape it. If you ask anybody with the yips, I've had the chipping yips. Um, and the chipping yips were the were terrible for me i don't look i don't have the best form i'm a low probably two handicap i hit the ball the way i hit the ball you know i've got a weird setup um i've got a strong grip but i like to play the game and i can play but my super strong grip and my weird setup is not good for pitching and chipping okay and so i would have the yips around the greens and i got to a point where i you know i'd be on my back foot i'd be laying sod I have a buddy of mine I play with who's brilliant around the greens. And he's like, it was just like watching a puppy get hit in the road. I mean, it was just, I didn't want to look at it. <laughs> right. And, and so what I, what I started doing, and I've worked with a couple of tour players, multiple tour players with the yips in their part of their game is I say, look, you probably had an underlying physiological problem, meaning bad technique, not, I don't really believe in the focal dystonia for everybody, which mm-hmm. was sent out around 1990 that took the golf world on and it's just kind of faded away. Um, it's an underlying mechanical flaw that you were able to overcome for a long time until you weren't right. Then it showed up like the panic attack. Panic attacks are real alarm and false alarm. And the panic attack continues because the false alarm takes over. Same thing happens in the yips. Now all of a sudden Bob shows up. Who's your yip man in your brain. And the minute you start feeling it, you get into avoidance mode, get out of it mode. I don't want anyone to watch me mode. Let me hurry up and get this over with mode and you got bad technique already, it's a disaster. So what I do is I try to say, look, we're going to, like most of the golfers in putting, 
who have the yips, they, somebody will say, oh, looks like you deceled on that. It's like, well, you decel on every putt you hit, right? I mean, blast shows you pretty much do. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? They try to make a quick move to accelerate. Oh, hence a yip. Okay. Yeah, they, they do it with. Yeah, they do it right. trying to correct it. And, I, and the same thing with chipping. So what I tell them is like, look, when Bob shows up, instead of judging it that you're a failure, you think you suck, you're terrible, take a couple deep breaths, laugh off Bob and go, yeah, okay, Bob, you're here. All right, reset now. Let's reset. Let's go back into our process and let's make sure we're using the proper technique. But don't be afraid to sit in it for a minute. The need to avoid embarrassment is what's driving it the most of the time the yips because most of the time your feeling if you succeed is relief that you got out of it, not mm -hmm. achievement and not joy. And what I did is I went and got myself that orange whip wedge trainer, unpaid, not, not I wish they'd pay me, and I learned to chip with it. Well, the start of this golf season, I started having problems again. And I called my, and my youngest daughter was home and she's a, she was a brilliant around the greens. And I said, come out with me and go hit some balls and help me. And she looked at me and she goes, it looks like your shoulders are a little out of alignment. Let's tilt to the front side. Let's get that orange whip back out. And all of a sudden I'm pitching and chipping exactly the way I wanted to again. Right. I had to acknowledge that Bob sometimes shows up, doesn't go away, take the deep breaths, just acknowledge that we have to deal with it. And and let's get the proper technique in play without judging why the presence of the psychological a-hole of Bob is there. Yeah, that's, I think that's, I think, I think trying to ignore it is the wrong thing to do in, in, in short, right? Basically just accept yeah. that it's there. And then, you know, whether it's something technique wise, like you just said, you know, it might be an adjustment like that or, or it might be something else, but, but yeah. definitely don't. And I also don't. think too, I tell my golfers, my putters who suck at or struggle with yips, you're not going to make the putt anyway. So let's just, not be in a hurry to see it miss. Exactly. Yeah. And they go, what do you mean? I said, you're not going to make it. You already told me you're not going to make it. So yeah. let's just make a good pass at it. And we started a game in my group um, that's been fun, but it has been mind numbing. Look, for the, us non-professionals, you know, there's a lot of rake backs, you know, pickups. That's good. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we started in our game, in our NASA or Wolf game, whatever, that the, a three putt is a dot and you have to pay the other team. It's not kind of like snake. Well, what we've done is we've said, okay, your second one is now worth two dots. Your third one's worth three dots. Your fourth one's worth four dots. Well, birdies can offset it. So you have a cumulative birdie side too. What it's done is it's absolutely created mind games for people that they start getting worse. It's like, oh, no, 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 you're finishing that. And you'll have two feet and you swear to God, you're putting in the masters right. because you have the you have the funniness and you have the anger and you have the, the razzing of your group around you all six feet apart, but mm -hmm. we call them whipped creams. And it has gotten so bad in our group of 15 or 20 guys that it's not uncommon to see a whip, a, a piece of whip or like a spray of whipped cream left on a green from the group in front of us. And it's become, well, what's happened is one of the worst putters that we had in our group that was guaranteed cash. I mean, it was, has become so good at putting that, it's, it's changed. And he's like, my handicap is I finally faced the dragon that I had. Like, I would just say, I'll rake that back to me. It doesn't matter. It matters now. So we got back into the, you know, we allowed ourselves to face the fear of it and, and get better because that's one of the, I swear to God, that's one of the reasons why players don't play in club championships, even as a 12 handicap, what do you have to lose? We don't want to pay post the 97 because you missed the three footers. Yeah. But that's what's fun. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. So I got a, here's a, uh, another question. Uh, Gabe asks, uh, what kind of pre-shot routine practice do you do with your tour players? And that's an interesting question for me because you hear some things where, where you should have, you know, a pre-shot routine doing it the same way every time. Some people will say that and some people will say that's ah, maybe not, not so true. You might not, might not need to. What, what are your thoughts on, on pre-shot routines? The, the, so as a psychologist, I really focus on the person. Okay. I think golf coaches should coach pre-shot routine too, okay? So, because you're going to work with them seeing a hit a lot of shots. And so one of the things that I use a routine for is not to be a dance routine, but to be a normal routine, okay? So it's where I can invest my energy and my time if I'm getting stressed is like just work. I had a pre-shot, a pre-pitch routine. I, I had a way of clearing my mind. I'd look at the ground, take a deep breath, and then I'd get the sign. I want golfers to do the same thing. But the first thing I ask every player is what do you like to do when you're hitting it well? Like at home, when nobody's there, what do you like to do? Like, I'll give you an example. So if I, if I have a tour player and 
they're struggling with a lot of times it's too much information. And I'll say, okay, why did your caddy just give you a 183 cover to a 205 pin? Are we really worried about a 22 yard miss? Okay. We don't need to know that because at home you'd shoot it and go 205. I want to hit it 200. Okay. And they're clear. So I like to see the pre-shot routine working like a funnel. Before you hit the shot, it's wide open. You start collecting information and it dials in to what you want to do. Mm-hmm. So the pre-shot routine should allow you to do that. So the fir- I always ask them, what do you like to do? I want them to be athletic. I don't think it needs to be, you know, if it works for Jason Day to close his eyes and visualize and, and use the focus band mentality, awesome. But I think, I think if you watch old golf, those golfers back then were ready to hit and ready to go. And they're good athletes. Okay. So I had a player that came and saw me and he was a really elite, he was a top ranked junior player and he was going to college and, and he said, uh, he starts hitting balls and, and he's taking his practice swing next to the ball. And I said, why are you doing that? And he said, look, this is exactly what happened. Look, I'm not changing that. Every mental coach I see tells me I shouldn't do that. I said, I just asked why you did it. He goes, because I feel like I can see the shot better from here. I said, then rock on, dude. Yeah. Like rock on. I think in practice, if we're doing our technical, what I call foundations, which are our mechanical movements, I'm not really worried about the pre-shot routine. I'd rather you rehearse the mechanical movement you're trying to ingrain. But if you need to use a pre-shot routine, and you probably should, because it probably will help you to develop one that you're, if, but if you're thinking how you have to do it to make sure you're doing it right, we're lost. And, I, and I'll share this example. So Billy Horschel and I were talking, we did a, an AJGA clinic together at his golf tournament down in um, at Sawgrass. And we're talking and he's always said, I don't know what you do with me, but I always feel better after we work. And I said, that's the greatest compliment you can give me. And he finally could put it into words because what he said was, I'm not out there trying to do what Brett told me to do. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not thinking, well, Brett told me to take two deep breaths, wiggle my butt, and then step into the shot. He said, that's going to take me away from hitting the shot. I want you to be natural. If you watch a great basketball free throw shooter, it's a, their pre-shot routine is as natural as they are. They may have a, a quirk in there, but that's okay. That's just yeah. part of it. And, and I think – you know, I think there's a couple things we should do. I think we shouldn't rocking, uh, uh, rocking chair it. So if we're stepping behind the ball and rock and go back in, don't be afraid to take a deep breath and just be there for a second. Don't be in a hurry to screw up. Um, but I think when you're stepping into the shot, I want you to have a little bit more of intention in your mind. Like, let's go, let's get after this. Um, I think those are the, the things that I, I think are really, really yeah. important. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that. We got a couple of questions on, on the yeah. chat up here. You want to here's, a, here's a good question from, uh, from Bryson, um, who's a coach. Yep. And he said, how do we manage the line between pushing your players to manage failure and uncertainty and finding that self-belief in time to leading up to events? And that's a, that's a great question, even, just for, even, for, the, even for the individual um, golfer who doesn't have a coach. And that's, yeah. a, that's a question that I wanted to ask. I did, a, I did a podcast with a colleague of mine who's a psychologist who's, who's moved and specializes in leadership and women's development and leadership situations. And she said something today that I thought was brilliant. She said, don't shame bucket people. And I went, what do you mean? And she's like, look, just to, to Bryson's point, we want to manage the line between pushing. We want to push, 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 push. But we don't want to shame, but we don't want to put them into a period where they see shame in themselves. And we don't want to be sarcastic. In other words, we want to say, look, um, there's going to be uncertainty. But if I'm going to push you, you're developing tools to handle uncertainty. Okay. But I believe that you can go do, oh, I didn't do it this, but I know it's in there. It's coming together. And our job as a coach is to pick them up, but also give them enough of a net that they feel the fall sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes if you feel the fall enough, like when we had, when our kids were young, my wife, as a psychologist, she probably hated it. And she's a nurse, but we, um, you know, the kids, she'd be like, Oh, don't do that. Don't. I said, look, if they do it once or twice, they're never going to do it again. Like if they put their hand in the door jam, trust me, in, unless they're from your side of the family, they're not going to put their hand back in that door jam again. Okay. She had an uncle who sawed himself out of a tree one time. So it's true. Okay. Uh, great uncle, uh, sore subject in the family, but I like to make fun of them. But the, the reality is, is that, that, Sometimes we have to fail to see the light, okay? But as a coach, we have to see the bigger picture. We have to understand that 
They didn't play well. Okay, but let, let me be honest with you. You know, when I sent you over to do that five-foot putting drill the other day, you looked like you were miserable there. So were you more miserable doing that drill or doing the or signing your scorecard? It's a choice. It's a question. Or, yeah. listen, you've done everything I've asked. You're getting after it. Stay patient. Yeah, I know it's tough. But as a coach, it's really, really difficult. Here's another question. question. I want to get back to a question on David. Um, yep. What was the bad shot analogy applied to thoughts as well? 100%. And it also leads to a second question about tension. Don't obsess over the occasional bad thought. Look, thoughts are nothing more than, a, than the radar blip that our brain sends out to look for threat. You're never going to have a positive thought in the heat of the moment spontaneously. So if you understand that thoughts are nothing more than just radar systems, that's it. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it, um, that, hang on, sorry. I, I've had a comment from my wife. She probably heard me talking about her, her family. Um, the negative thought is no more than what we give it attention to. So the fact that you're having a negative thought doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. It just means your brain identified the threat. And once we have the emotional reaction to it, our brain goes, oh, crap, we found it. So I did, a, I did an article a couple of years ago for Golf Digest at Sawgrass. And they asked me, they said, what do you think about 17? I said, it's great. It's a hole, right? But don't let me be stupid. It's a hole with a lot of water around it. And, you know, Tiger doesn't like it as a 17th hole at Sawgrass. He thinks it's a great hole, but not at number 17. Why? Because there's a whole lot of pressure to it. Okay. So players are thinking about that the morning they wake up. They're thinking about the wind. When they're on 14, they're looking at it. When they're on 11, they're looking at it. Well, look at it. And then go, hey, when I get over there, what am I going to hit? Probably a wedge. I've hit a lot of wedges in my life. When you get up there and you look at the water, and you look like if you get up on a hole and you see water right, you go, I see water right. Okay. Like when we drive, we know that there's guardrails on the side and there's fall off on each side. But we don't sit there and go, don't go over the cliff. Don't. If you, don't, if you do that, you're going to drive towards the cliff. Not because the brain is not hearing the word don't. It's because the brain is going, holy crap, that's tension. And you're directing your attention to it. Okay. How do you swing under tension often? Here's something. Don't try to calm down. Instead, if you feel tension, take a couple fast practice swings. Take a couple deep breaths with your hands and squeeze the living crap out of them. Yeah. And then release them. The worst thing that we can do is tell somebody who's having anxiety is to calm down. I'd rather for them to tell me, hey, embrace what you're feeling. Tell me what you're feeling. Sorry, my phone is buzzing like crazy. So I think that's, uh, you know, what we should do. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's good. We've got time for maybe one more question. Okay. Um, and let me pull up one that I had since. So, um, you know, with kind of going back to, and I, I, going back to everything that's going on in the world right now, and I had some college coaches on the other day, and, and you know, one of the questions I get from my students who are, you know, juniors, and some of them are actually seniors, is how do you manage the kids disappointment in that you know the loss of their season some of the college kids you know that you know they're you know they're seniors they lost out on their last year month of you know you know so how do how do we manage the important months of recruiting and, and practice you know how do they get them i'm kind of going back to the beginning of what we started what what do you tell these kids that that are basically shut down for for either the rest of their college career because they're seniors or or like you know, like my son's a junior and, and he was starting the recruiting process and yeah. For, for squash. And now it's kind of shut down and it's, and it's, you know, there's a disappointment there. You know, I, I think um, it's completely honest to be disappointed. You know, I was, I was excited by the NCAA that gave everybody back an extra year of eligibility. Not everybody's going to take advantage of it. Some people are going to go into jobs. Um, there's nothing that we can say to take a high school senior and say, look, we just lost, you just lost your prom. You just lost your senior season. There's nothing we can say. I mean, you know, in Tuscaloosa, eight years ago, they had the Tuscaloosa tornado on, on April 27th that devastated and they canceled classes and finals and graduation and all that. Crap happens, yeah. okay? And all you can do is be as an adult is to be empathetic towards it and say, you know, I'm sorry you feel that way. You're right to feel that way. Um, and, and I just, I hurt for you because you know, I was able to have my experience. How can I, how can I as a coach create that experience? Well, I can't, but I can do other things. 
Okay. I can write a letter to each of those players and be, you know, and not just pass them off. Um, but be really honest with them and say, look, you know, I know this sucks. Uh, there's no doubt. There's no doubt about this. Um, this hurts. I think you can also say, you know, look, we can't, we don't know how the season was going to go, but at least you would have had the opportunity. You don't know. Um, this is, this is not like the athletic department ran out of money. This was a national emergency. It's a worldwide epidemic pandemic. You're never going to forget this, but is this going to be a scar for you? Or is this going to be a building block for you to look back and say, Hey, look, I was a victim on some things. And, um, you know, now I'm, I'm ready to, to get back to business type type of stuff. stuff. Right. So, So, um, just lastly here, you know, you've got some exciting things coming out. You know, there's, yeah. yeah, So let's kind of finish up here. Let's, let's hear about what you've got going on because you're, you're, you never sit still and you got a lot of cool things coming (laughs) out. So let's hear about it. You know, know, I can't, the, um, the, the thing that I'm most excited about right now is we, we, I was spending some time with a coach, um, over Christmas and he said, you know, you do a lot of great stuff with players. And I just feel like as coaches, we take your material and then we kind of apply it to us. And I thought it was a really nice compliment, but it also created a gap. And he said, can you create some things for leaders, coaches, people who are head coaches, people who are assistant, co- people who are parents, tell right. us what to do. So, uh, Brett Basham, who's in my office, who runs all my marketing and all my other stuff. He, um, he's got a master's in leadership and he was a leadership coach at Alabama for five years, University of Alabama. He was a four time starter, a four year starter in college at, at Ole Miss and baseball and really good catcher. And he sat down with me and he was with me on the trip. He said, what we're talking about is building catalysts. You know, we, more time than ever we need in our life, we need catalysts to be the leaders, right. to, 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 to define and inspire the people in our lives to make them better. And you know, he was a hundred percent correct. And so what we've done is we started something called the Catalyst School, which is, is going to launch in two forms. Um, right now, it's a free form. So if you go to the catalystschool.com and sign up, and no matter if you're a player, it, the, the information in this is ridiculous um, because we've got not just me, we've got Brett uh, contributing to it, Brett Basham. Um, and, and so it's going to launch Catalyst Live is going to be a monthly program, which is very inexpensive. Listen, it's less than a week of coffee. Um, and it's going to be regular weekly live training webinars with me on the psychological reasons as to why people are um, uh, in the leading process, okay, what they can do to get better. And then we're launching a Catalyst Masterclass, which is based on the eight or nine factors that I see that great leaders do um, and how to, be, how to create a connection with the people you work with, how to lead through chaos, how to, and some factors like that. And then we have a zillion amount of information that we've done with podcast interviews, conversations. I just did a podcast interview with John Brandon, who's a good friend of mine, who's a basketball coach at University of Cincinnati. He's won four straight conference championships where he is. This is his first year at Cincinnati. He took on a new job, took on a, a new challenge, and won the conference. Um, and so it's, it's sharing those things across multiple sports, multiple industries, and saying, look, why? Because I, I used to go to the PGA Teaching and Coaching Summit, or I'd go to the baseball summits, and I'd go, why don't we have golf coaches at the baseball and baseball coaches at the golf and football coaches at basketball? Because if we only learn from our silo we're in, everything looks the same. Mm-hmm. And I went, Oh hell, I'm gonna do that. So now I'm going to start blending them all together and saying, look, there's some common cores here and I want to engage in the discussions. And so somebody like Bryson, you know, as a coach can get on there and say, okay, look, I've got a resource now that's very inexpensive that I can go to every single day and learn from. And so if you go to the catalystschool.com, all you got to do is put in your email right now. You'll be kept up to date on what we're doing. And we've been putting a lot of our online content over there and cross-referencing it at my personal website at brettmccabe.com. But the reason we're doing that is it's really been a shift in my business. What something I enjoy. People ask me, what do you enjoy you know, doing? And I said, I love working with coaches. I always have. I love working with my players. But at Bama and stuff, I do a lot of work with coaches on helping them understand how to coach players better understand what the challenges that they're facing and why are they facing those challenges and what are the underlying psychological principles that they can put in place to achieve it. Yeah. Well, terrific. Well, Brett, you know, this was great for me. I always enjoyed talking with you and listening in and um, want to thank everybody out there for, for, we had a lot of people on, on different mediums and I want to thank everybody there. This video will be available uh, on my Facebook channel, Brett, I'll send you a copy so you can put it on your, you. on YouTube. 
Um, and if anybody wants to get in touch with either of us, I would say social media is probably the best way to reach out. Easy. Yep. Easy. For our websites. So yep. Brett, thanks again. Thank uh, you. Nice talking with you. I think, you know, and if there's any questions that come in, I'll, I'll filter them over to you. Sounds good. And uh, maybe, maybe we'll do this again in a couple of yeah. weeks. Why not? Let's do it. Let's have a good time. I think we had a, we had a large, you know, large group of people watching. So and some great questions. So um, thanks again. Yeah. Have a great night. And we'll, you too. We'll, and we'll speak to you soon. Got it. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody.